So at this point, we already know that Wano is important to the Void Century, or at least Wano's people, because the Poneglyphs, which carry the history of the Ancient Kingdom, which was the mysterious kingdom that disappeared during the Void Century, were created by the Kozuki family. The Kozuki family of Wano. So here is all the confirmation that you need to know that the Kozuki family and Wano are tied to the Ancient Kingdom and the Void Century. And you know, aside from all of this, we know that it, it seems pretty likely that we are going to obtain a massive amount of new information about the Void Century if Robin decides to divulge it at the conclusion of this arc, if for no other reason than the fact that uh, the Strats acquired Poneglyphs from Big Mom, Kaido is suggested again to have additional Poneglyphs, including the next road Poneglyph that they need, and by the end of this arc, you would assume that Robin would read them. In my opinion, Wano is a huge stepping stone on our journey of eventually finding Raftel. In many ways, it could be historically significant as well, as in a part of the history. It almost sounds out of the box when you think it, uh, but this is exactly what Oda has implied from the story. 900 years ago, Wano was a place that was allied to the ancient kingdom. The Kozuki were not just the rulers of Wano 20 years ago in the past before Orochi overthrew them. They are suggested to, it's not confirmed, but are suggested to have been the rulers of Wano historically over the last, since the Void Century at least, if not longer. A ruling family entrusted with the ability to acquire the secrets of the Void Century. And so I think that it is fair to wonder. What other secrets may be lying dormant in Wano? Hey YouTube, Joeboy here. So, there was an absolutely great theory about Wano that I first read on Twitter about a month ago posted by the user Fifth Kablamo. Possibly the second greatest theory of Wano so far behind time travel. In the theory he connects Ors, or the race of continent pullers, Ors and Ors Jr., with Wano. So back in the Thriller Bark arc, when we first got to meet the zombie giant, Ors, Moria says this, Upon finding his corpse in the land of ice, I couldn't stop trembling. I could not believe that something so fierce and wrecked havoc in the seas 500 years ago. The nations that fell at his hands were taken whole, island and everything, and he created a nation of villains. The one who created the famous legend of the continent pooler was right before my eyes. So if you take a moment to stop and digest, this is kind of a crazy story. It's almost unbelievable. Uh, Moria is suggesting that Ors conquered islands whole and literally moved them. He, he is a continent puller. He, he conquered an island and moved it across the sea. We got to keep in mind that we are reading One Piece, but even still, this is one of the more unbelievable things that is uh, supposed to have occurred. And I think for the longest time, people basically ignored it. That at least was the case until recently, and we finally got introduced to the country of Wano, which design-wise is very intriguing. What is an interesting fact about the country of Wano is it's almost made of six distinct parts, each of which have its very own climate, unique to the rest. It is almost as if Wano is comprised of six unique islands, unique islands that you would discover upon traveling the Grand Line, squished together, side by side. It is quite literally the first thing in the story that even suggests that the legend of Ors might in fact be true and that these islands were literally moved side by side. And as if to illustrate the connection, Oda gave us potentially a clue with another island very near Wano called Onigashima with uh, what appears to be a giant continent pillar skull as its main ornamentation. And even though we only have really this one line as evidence or clues as to the history of Ors, there are other things that potentially connect them as well. We know that Moria visited Wano at some point in time because 20 years ago he was able to retrieve the corpse and the sword of the legendary Wano samurai, Ryuma. We also know that Ors died in a cold country. He froze to death. And in Wano you have Ringo, which appears to be a very cold country. Was that where Ors died? And is that where Moria found him? 
If you just stop right here, this is one of the very most persuasive theories of Inwano. No doubt. Ors in no small part is responsible for the creation of the country of Wano as we see it today, having conquered many islands, uh, possibly nearby Wano, and moved them together. Finally having died, I would guess, moving the country of Ringo. And it was here that Moria was able to later discover his corpse. But what it lacks, if you stop right here, is any sort of uh, definitive significance. And it leaves us with far more questions than answers. Why exactly was Ors conquering countries and then literally moving these islands together? What if the people of Wano this entire time, did they fight off Ors, but he decided to spare them and not the people of these other islands? And what about this line from Moria about how Ors created what he called a country of villains? We would have to assume that the country of villains would in fact be Wano. And this almost seems to suggest an alliance between Ors and Wano. All of this at face value, honestly, guys, just does not make a whole lot of sense. We have you know, so a lot of holes here that we need to fill. So anyway, guys, it could be true that the perception that we have of Ors from Hogback and Moria is relatively true. He was a demon, a monster of the sea, he conquered various lands, did whatever random thing that he wanted to do. It happened to include Wano. He created Wano, but it's like not really all that important. He brought some friends along and they celebrated their villainous ways. And eventually the people of Wano fought him off or killed him or he died on his own. This could totally be the case, but I tend to believe that this is not quite um, how it seems to be or how it was perceived or, or the story surrounding him is not quite accurate. And so the first thing that I want to do is I want to connect Ors with Ors Jr. A lot of us sort of have this mental image of what Ors was like in the past, but you got to keep in mind that um, that isn't necessarily the truth. Imagine 500 years in the future and the stories that they potentially would tell about Ors Jr. from the perspective of somebody in the world government or the Marines, the people who actually control the news and and the delivery of information. Of course, the stories about Ors Jr. is he's going to be this massive demon who was, you know, in cahoots with villains and planned on destroying the world. But we know, because we know Ors Jr. and his relationships, that that is not the case. He was actually kind of a friendly guy. Oda loves his parallels. He loves to parallel various characters with others, relationships, and whatnot. And I am not entirely convinced that Ors wasn't very much the same as Ors Jr. When they're talking about him creating a country of villains, I kind of see that as the same as Ors Jr. being a part of a, a villainous pirate crew. So the relationship that Ors Jr. had with Whitebeard might be similar to the relationships that Ors might have had with whoever, potentially Wano, in the past. And so again, going back to the speculation that Ors actually moved uh, various islands together in the creation of what is now present day Wano and that he created a country of villains, but he was actually friendly with Wano, it, it creates uh, an entirely different narrative. It actually suggests that Wano was also interested in acquiring these islands and maybe asked or ordered Ors uh, to grab them for, for whatever reason. But I think that this really you know, brings us to another stopping point, a, a larger question. I don't think you can speculate any further without some sort of destination you're trying to get to. to like, why would Wano be interested in acquiring islands? Again, it suggested that the Kozuki were ruling over Wano at this time. We don't assume that they are bad people that are just greedy, lusting for power, wealth, territory, resources, and the like. So what good motivation could they have for wanting to do this? And so guys, I do have an answer for this, but in order to do this, it requires me to make a huge jump. Not something that is suggested, but a possibility that I think is persuasive enough and interesting. What I want to point out to you guys is that humans in the world of One Piece live over 100 years. Dr. Korea, for instance, is 140 years old. Looking at other species, giants in particular are noted for living 300 years or more, giants being much larger than humans. The only race that we know of that is larger than giants is, of course, the continent puller. And it just makes you wonder whether or not the continent puller is equally or even more long-lived than giants. 
Could somebody like Oris have lived for 500 years? Zunisha, for instance, has lived for at least a thousand. So yeah, guys, I certainly think that there's a relationship between the size of the thing and how long the thing lives. And so when it says in the story that Oris essentially died 500 years ago, uh, he would obviously have been, I, I, would, I would think, at least as old as an elder giant. So we're talking about 200, maybe 300 years old. 300 years before 500 years is 800 years ago, at the very end of the Void Century. We're now talking about Ors as somebody who potentially lived during the Void Century. And so for me guys, this changes the game on what it is that it's possible to speculate as far as Ors and his history in Wano, and what his motivations might have been. I think that a lot of you may know my theories about the Void Century, but uh, to sum them up relatively quickly, you can look up the videos themselves if you would like. But uh, one of my, my general head canons, one of my larger beliefs, is that the ancient kingdom was actually a kingdom of pirates, or that is what they were the original pirates who acquired uh, futuristic technology and all sorts of, of wealth and, and power because of their ability to sail the sea, meet many different cultures, befriend them, and acquire the things that they are good at. So you could visit the island where they were master chefs, or you could visit the island where they have futuristic technology, or visit the island where they have the best medicine, and you put all of those things together. This is how a group of people could potentially be able to befriend uh, the, the Shandorans, as well as the Minks of Zo, the Fishman of Fishman Island, and the Samurai of Wano, and many, many others. When the Ancient Kingdom realized that they were going to lose, they put a giant puzzle across the entire Grand Line with the Poneglyphs as sort of a challenge and obstacle for future uh, sailors to be able to discover. I think that it associates the Ancient Kingdom with seafaring. The number one skill that you must have in order to discover the true history is to be able to navigate the notoriously treacherous Grand Line. Almost as if those who would embody the, the ideals of the Ancient Kingdom would have likewise to them been masters of the ocean. And in the same sort of vein, you have uh, what I think are clear relationships between the Ancient Kingdom and many various places. Places that you just would not be able to befriend unless you were, were a traveler. And you know, here's something else that I think is very profound. Of course, uh, you could find a Poneglyph randomly, but in reality, what, what is taking place is the Ancient Kingdom left these Poneglyphs, they entrusted these Poneglyphs with groups that they were friends with. And as we learned in Zo, uh, they also have uh, the discretion to reveal these Poneglyphs and their contents to those that they deem worthy. So while you could raise a country to the ground in order to find its Poneglyphs, the more traditional way is to, just as the Ancient Kingdom did many years in the past, travel to these places and become their friends. Earn their trust and respect. And I think that this is just another thing that makes sense, that the Ancient Kingdom was a kingdom of sea travelers, potentially the OG pirates, those people that Brooke tells us would have originally sung Bink Sake. The most technologically advanced country that had ever existed that acquired this technology essentially by visiting various places in the world that each had their own specialties and being able to combine and communicate and share. Doesn't it just make sense to basically set a puzzle in the sea? We know at the end of the Grand Line, there's something that tells everyone of the existence of the Poneglyphs and allows them to begin the, the journey in the search for them, it creates that mystery. Wouldn't it make sense to lay this mystery down and entice other people to attempt to do essentially what it is that they were famous for doing in the past, what it is that was the foundation of what they stood for? And you know, speaking of parallels, Odo loves his parallels. You have Luffy here with his pirate crew recruiting people uh, from all across the sea, each with their own unique specialty that they can add to the group as a whole. And lo and behold, the pirate crew is better because of it. So yeah, I believe that the Ancient Kingdom was at its very core a kingdom of what at that time may have been called pirates. And this leads into one of my other uh, core beliefs and core head canons of the story is that uh, the Ancient Kingdom wanted and, and, and fought for the protection of all the various races of the world. This is the most supported void century theory that is not yet confirmed, period. You don't become friends with the fishmen and the minks 
if you don't have some sort of horse in the fight of, of humans versus the non-humans. And then Tantara tell us specifically, or they associate specifically, uh, the celestial dragons with oppression of their people. The celestial dragons straight up believe that they are better than the non-humans, and I think that the ancient kingdom, as sea travelers making friends with the people from around the world, took offense to that. I just think that this is another thing that just makes a, an absurd amount of sense when you think enough up about it. What is Luffy doing as he is traveling the Grand Line? He is, of course, visiting new places, but at the same time, he's making friends with each distinct a race of people. If you look at some of the most notorious pirates and seafarers in present day, somebody like Whitebeard or, or Big Mom, their crews are incredibly diverse. And I think that it's because Oda is alluding to the fact that the original pirates from the Void Century believed much the same and acted in much of the same way. The more that you travel and experience and interact with these various peoples, you realize that you're not all that different. It's easier to become friends with them. But as you are isolated, separated, the fishmen at the bottom of the sea and the celestial dragons living on top of their giant rock, it's very easy to call them beasts. But yeah, to get the point here, just to move on and, and make a statement, I just personally believe that the ancient kingdom, what they stood for, was a unification of all of the various tribes of the world so that they would get along, which is why it was part of the Fishman's Dream, as well as uh, part of the objectives of the Void Center that the ancient kingdom was never able to fulfill, to get the Fishman out from underneath the ocean and onto the surface. This was Joy Boy's failed promise. He wanted the fishmen to live with the humans so that they could understand that they are not all that different. And so I brought these theories up for two reasons. The first connection is between the ancient kingdom and Oars. From this perspective, as a group of people who traveled the world and befriended uh, nearly everybody, regardless of the way that you looked, it just makes sense for the ancient kingdom if they at all met Oars, if he lived for a millennia to befriend him. And for him to become a subordinate much the same as Orr's Jr. was to Whitebeard. What essentially here that I am speculating is the connection between Orr's and Wano is really a connection between Orr's, Wano, and the Ancient Kingdom. But the larger theory, guys, and the reason that I made this video, what I think is far more profound is, earlier we asked the question, why exactly was Orr's taking islands and dragging them together in Wano? For the last several minutes, we've been talking about the ancient kingdom as a group of seafarers who visited many places of the world and befriended them. Acquiring each place's unique technology and abilities and combining it and connecting it to create what was at that time the greatest power in the world, with the most advanced technology. And while acquiring friends and through the, the connections that they have established, they acquired a singular desire to help the world get along and erase existing prejudices. Why exactly was Oars and Wano interested in creating a mega island comprised of many various islands from across the Grand Line? Maybe because Wano is a monument of the past and the void century, a part of the ancient kingdom's dream, a dream now lost in time. A place where people no longer needed to travel the treacherous Grand Line in order to connect and, and build relationships with other islands. A place where you merely need to walk across a bridge in order to find an entirely different culture. Is Wano the ancient kingdom's paradise that was never fully realized? And you know, when you think about it from this angle, uh, it's kind of profound, because the Kozuki wish for Wano to open up its borders. The rest of Wano and the Shogun are completely against that. But under this assumption, with this theory in mind, it's almost opening up the borders is what Wano originally was meant to stand for. But yeah, that's pretty much all I had to say today. As always, I'm curious as to what you guys think. Share your thoughts in the comment section below. Like the video if you liked the video, dislike the video if you dislike the video, make sure to subscribe if you want to be notified for my future content. And as always guys, have a wonderful day.